Thank you, thank you. I'm not even a nominee, but I feel like it. <laughs> well, welcome to the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures, the largest institution in the United States devoted to the arts, sciences, and artists of movie making. The Academy Museum of Motion Pictures acknowledges the Tongva people as the traditional caretakers of the water and land on which we program, curate, educate, convene, and discuss. We honor and respect Tongva ancestors and the Tongva community today, which continue to nurture this land and water through traditional practice, activism, art, and education. We also acknowledge their continue, continued work to safeguard cultural resources. My name is Lahani Cook, and I'm the manager of public engagement. My pronouns are she, her, and um, thank you for joining us in our David Geffen Theater for the live action shorts nominee panel, presented as a part of our Oscars week programming. Before we begin the panel, public programming for the 2023 Oscar week is made possible by the Ruderman Family Foundation, which promotes authentic representation in the entertainment industry and full inclusion of people with disabilities throughout all sectors of society. I would like to thank our ASL interpreters who will be assisting today. Their names are, Fe are Felix Villarreal, Paola Morales, Romina Mena. And now, please help me in welcoming to the stage Senior Vice President of Member Relations, Global Outreach, and Awards Administration, Tom Oyer. Hello, hi everyone. Great to see you all today. Um, I'm here representing our Member Relations and Awards Administration team, and today we are celebrating our five live action short film nominees. Now, you might be asking yourself, how did we get here? How do we have, how did these nominees come to be? So I'm just gonna give a brief rundown of the process and how it works. The first step is that films need to qualify. In order to be eligible, film has to be qualified. And to do that, there are a few different ways by which live action short films can qualify. First method is by doing a one week qualifying theatrical release in one of our qualifying cities. The second method is through our qualifying festival process. Basically, the summation of that is that our, we have a list of qualifying festivals and specific juried awards, and the films that win those juried awards are automatically eligible to submit for Academy consideration. The, second met the third method is uh, through Student Academy Awards, uh, films that win either gold, silver, or bronze medals at the Student Academy Awards are also eligible to submit. From there, we have our submission. The next step of the process is the films have to submit. We have our submission process by which they provide their films to the Academy for consideration. This year, we had 200 live action short films submitted and eligible. And yes, that is a record. Uh, uh, so we received submitted films from all of, oh, there we go, all right. A record year. Uh, we receive our submissions from films from all over the world. Uh, I want to give a special thank you to Michael Benedict, Lauren McPhee, and many others on our Academy team that manage the submission process all year round, and without them, this category would not be possible. So thank you. <laughs> uh, so then once we get our submitted films, the next step of the process is the voting process. And through that, we work with our Academy members to vote, the, view the films and vote. Uh, members from four branches are invited to participate. They're members from the short films and feature animation branch, the director's branch, the producer's branch, and the writer's branch. Members from those four branches are invited and then you can opt in to participate. By doing so, they are then have to watch a certain number of films in order to be eligible to vote. And then from there, they vote in December to determine a shortlist of 15 films. That shortlist was announced in December, and then from there, there is a second round of voting, again, members from those same branches, that can view the 15 shortlisted films and then vote to determine the five nominees. And now that we have our five nominees, we now open it up to the entire Academy membership, and the entire membership votes in all 23 categories to determine the Oscar winner in each category, which we will find out on Sunday. Little show you should check out. Um, all right, and so I want to take this moment to really thank all the Academy members who volunteer and spend that time to view all these films. This process would not be possible without your work and your participation, and please know how much we all appreciate it. And we will continue asking for your help again every year. <laughs> uh, next, it's my pleasure to introduce to you a governor of the Short Films and Feature Animation branch. He's an Academy Award nominated filmmaker, previous nominee in this category, and currently in his 21st year as a governor. Uh, please welcome John Bloom. Thank you, everybody. I wanna quickly reiterate something that, that Tom said because it's more than true. 
Tom Moyer, uh, Michael Benedict, and their staff are the glue that holds everything together in our three categories. And we can't thank them enough. I've known Tom before my 21 years as a governor, and um, he's the best, and he does a spectacular job. And Tom, thank you again. Um, all right, all right, all right. Let's get this party started. Welcome to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures, and this splendid theater. To this, our annual opportunity to meet our live action short filmmakers. I'm John Bloom, one of three governors in the short films and feature animation branch, along with my fellow governors, Bonnie Arnold, and Marlon West. We welcome you to this nominee's symposium, the third of three. We do it with all three categories, and we're ecstatic to be here today to talk about this. It's my privilege to introduce our moderator for our talk with our nominated short filmmakers, producer, director, Peggy Reisky is an accomplished filmmaker. <clears throat> she has produced 17 projects, including three shorts, produced three films with John Sayles, and two with Jodie Foster. She served as dean at the Loyola Marymount University School of Film and Television, and as head of producing for the NYU graduate film program. At the Academy, she is a long-term member of the producers branch and recently the head, the chair of the Student Academy Awards. But most impressively, Peggy is also an Oscar winner for producing and directing a live action short, and, it was, and that was her first directorial effort, so that's pretty impressive. Trevor, Peggy's short film, is nothing less than a milestone in short films. A poignant comedy about a young teen whose world is turned upside down when word spreads at school, he might be gay. Trevor is amongst the most known, successful, profitable, and important shorts ever made. And that's to say nothing about its cultural import Peggy's essential role in, sequen in, in subsequently forming the Trevor Project is another important accomplishment. Now the largest 24-7 LGBTQ plus suicide hotline. But let me tell you how that came about. When Peggy was finishing Trevor, Quite rightfully so, they were working on the end credits, and they wanted to include a gay-oriented suicide hotline. And guess what? They couldn't find one. And so Peggy did it herself, and that says a heck of a lot about the kind of person she is. So, <laughs> Trevor is an exceptional short film. Please join me in welcoming its creator, our exceptional moderator, Peggy Reisky. Good. Thank you Go get so him. much. <laughs> Holy moly. It's so nice to be here, and I welcome all of you to what I think is one of the most special events during Oscars Week here at the Academy. Um, 
I want to say thanks to the governors for the wonderful work they do to keep the academy going all year long. And I'm so grateful to be able to welcome this global representation of filmmaking in the panel that we're going to start with very, very shortly. But first, let me be, before we begin, I'd like to welcome our ASL interpreters um, for our program. And I know, bless you, you're going to be standing here and taking over um, mid-center. So it'll be very easy uh, for folks to see. So without further ado, um, it's my pleasure to be able to introduce, uh, first of all, the filmmaker for The Red Suitcase. Um, I Please help me welcome to the stage Cyrus Neshvad. Hey, Cyrus. Next up is Night Ride filmmaker Eirik Tevitin and Godli Larsen. Thank you and welcome. Uh, next up from France, Le Pupil, director Alicia Rorvaker and her producer, Alfonso Cuaron. Yay! Next up is the filmmaker for Evalu, Anders Walter, and I'm sorry, he told me American, Anders Walter and Rebecca Prujan. And last but not least, our friends from Ireland for making an Irish goodbye, Tom Barkley and Ross White. <laughs> Looks like we got some representatives. Hey, so welcome, welcome all. Um, I'm going to start out with a few general questions and look forward to hearing what y'all have to say in that regard. So let me ask you, first of all, these are exquisite films, really beautiful. And they represent so many things that are quite sensitive subjects, including issues about identity, loss, harassment, child abuse. And one of the things I'd love to know is when you're thinking about that, how did you think about how this, first of all, talk a little bit about why you felt film was the best way? Because honestly, I know you have tons of ideas about possible projects, but why was film the right way to tell this story? And what either research or what did you do to prepare yourself to take on the issues that are in the main theme of your film? So if I may, Jens, who brought the rain with them <laughs> Sorry, from Ireland. We did indeed. Um, yeah, thank you for having us here. Um, yeah, our film, An Irish Goodbye, you know, it's sort of, it looks at loss, uh, it looks at grieving and the ritual around grief and sort of being thrown back together with your family in that aftermath. Um, and I think we, we wanted to explore that in, in a sort of a light way, a way that felt true to life and, and looked at both the light and the dark in those moments. You know, we, we speak a lot about um, how that moment of grieving, you know, those strange instances where you, you have a, a, f a need to sort of laugh at a funeral or this sort of bizarre kind of juxtaposition of feelings. And that feels very true to life for us. So we wanted to explore that in, in our film. And yeah, that was kind of where that came from. Beautiful. Um, can you, uh, we're going to cut over to our wonderful folks from Ivalu. Anders, can you talk a little bit about yours? No, so it's uh, Ivalu is based on a, a Danish graphic novel um, that was extremely poetic. I didn't think that um, I was doing or going to do a film about incest. Um, it's obviously a very dark and tough subject matter. But the graphic novel was so poetic and... Um, really was a direct inspiration in terms of how to translate this into the into cinema language. Um, so there was something about, it takes place in Greenland, of course, there was just something about the way that the nature impacts uh, the young girl's story um, that really spoke to me and and also, of, of course, was very visually um, appealing and to place this small individual in such a vast and epic landscape in order to communicate that feeling of, of feeling lonely. Um, yeah, and, and I've told, I've done nine films now, and they all deal with, with children in who finds themselves in 
a life-changing situation that is unfair. Um, so yeah, I love to tell those stories that are really, um, um, the, the, you know, give give the children a voice. Thank you for that. Yes, please. I think I mean you also asked why we would do a film about this, and I think this subject matter, incest, is um, it's a tab taboo, not just in Greenland, but and the problem is not just a Greenlandic problem. It's a taboo and a problem all over the world. And I think um, for us, putting making it into a film. In a way, it opens people's minds and hearts in a different way. We're so used to having all these, you know, sociologists or politicians with all these, you know, documented facts about this and that and numbers, which is also important. But I think ha making a movie is a way of having people change their mind on the, and open up to have a debate and put, you know, be able to talk about the subject matter because that's the only way you break a taboo, is to start a conversation. Beautiful. Thank you so much. We want to also now come on over to uh, Lupe Peel and Alicia and Alfonso. Can you talk a little bit about your process? Uh, yes, the the movie <laughs> we did, it's um, about the eternal question how to split a cake. Who <laughs> 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 deserve the cake? And um, if we th think the cake is everything, can be everything also today. The movie is 1943, mm -hmm. but uh, everywhere there is a cake. And uh, who uh, keep the power, sorry for my English, I, I try. Who keep the power normally wants to take the cake, all for them. And uh, who deserve the cake, the little girls, the um, nannies or the people that are outside, the dogs, the chimney sweeper, chimney sweeper, chimney sweeper uh, the <laughs> vagabonds, chimney. So, and uh, I decided to do it into a movie, first of all, because Alfonso um, called, call, called me, called me, called me. Call me, and says, do you want to make a movie? He didn't uh, <laughs> tell me you want to make a book. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I, this, I immediately, he told me if I want to, to think about, make a movie about Christmas. And uh, I immediately thought about a letter from Elsa Murante to Goffredo Fofi. And this letter was full of images, the cake, the, um, the Christmas, so uh, also the Christmas, the nativity, is one image. We pray in front of an image. Uh, not all pray, I mean, uh, many people pray in front of uh, this image. And um, so I thought the movie was the best way to tell this story. And also I was very happy to be free about the length See, so like to use exactly the time I feel I need to, to tell the story. And this is the big freedom of a short movie that you are really free about timing somehow more than with a long movie. And so I don't know if I answer, you want to say something? <laughs> the only thing I want to add is my involvement is that I wanted to taste her cake. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Me too. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, I'd love to now talk to uh, Eirik um, and God about Night Ride, which is, um, well, I don't want to give anything away. Go ahead. Yeah, our film is about, um, um, yeah, if you want to go home, take a cab, not a streetcar. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, yeah, obviously it's about uh, some social responsibility. Um, and I would say it was a natural... Um, the, 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 f the film is like a, a silent movie, so it, it, it could be, you know, um, could only be very visual, I would say. Uh, it's like, a, um, yeah, Buster Keaton uh, kind of inspired... Um, story uh, so so yeah that was a 
it was very much meant to be a film. Do you yeah. want to add something? Well, well, you know, sh should we mind our own business or should we stand up for others? Um, Night Ride is also it's about finding courage inside oneself to raise the voice against any kind of uh, injustice and to bring this story for us. I mean, we are doing films, so that's what we do, and it became a film. And but to bring this situation in into a tram is doing something with the story because uh, nobody can escape and they have to take decisions or uh, and, and the, 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 the woman driving the tram had to take a decision whether to turn her back to everything or to face the problem. So it's an interesting arena to, to, to shoot on the location. Thank you. I have so many things I want to follow up with, but I will hold them for the next round. Um, and last but not least, the beautiful, the red suitcase. Yeah, actually, in the beginning, I was not intending to do a short movie, but at one moment, it went uh, for me very urgent to do something about it. And this happened uh, back 2019. Uh, I was at my parents. We were having dinner and uh, around the conversation, my mother told me that she's in contact with our family in Iran and that uh, she heard uh, from her friends, her sister, that uh, women were disappearing in Iran just uh, because they were telling their opinion or uh, a, a, a woman disappeared because she didn't put her, uh, head, her hijab correctly. And uh, I heard this. And, uh, but I hate politics, I had all, all these things, but uh, when I went home, it's like you hear somebody is in danger and you turn yourself the other side and you tell to yourself, I didn't hear it and I couldn't do this. And a uh, few weeks later, I said, I have to do something about it. I cannot just leave it like this. And I decided then uh, to do a short movie, let's say. Doing something, you know, because around me, all my friends were saying, Iran is beautiful, let's go for holidays. I said, no, it's not like this. So, And at that moment, uh, I decided to have a main actress in the movie, a girl, Iranian girl, with a hijab, coming in the airport of Luxembourg and from there on create a story where we can talk about the free will of the woman, which is the main thing two years after really happened, you know. And back 2019, nobody knew about this, so it was for me some kind of mission to talk about this. And today I'm relieved because the whole world knows about this, so I'm happy about that. You were pressing. So let me ask my Irish goodbye colleagues, uh, Tom and Ross. Uh, by the way, I want you to know, producers, I'm not overlooking you. <laughs> Being one of you, and I know how often that happens. Um, anyway, you know, the, the Irish goodbye for folks who haven't seen it. Um, can I just double check? Is this are, are the uh, visuals in the right order? Okay, thank you. Uh, the film follows loss in a touching and humorous way between two siblings dealing with grief and reconciliation in the, in the wake of their mother's death. And in the film, for those who haven't seen it, one of the big issues comes up is they discover a list of the hundred things she would have wanted to do in her life. And that list is the thing that becomes a catalyst for the film and what helps bring them together. So I wonder how the idea for that is the driving force for this, for the plot came together. And also, would you please talk a little bit about the casting, your approach to casting? Yeah. Um, so to begin with, um, Ross and I had both moved. Um, we had been living together in London. Um, we had been writing plays separately. And then when we decided that we were going to pursue filmmaking together, we both moved back to our hometowns. And so there was a theme of um, sort of leaving home returning home and being sort of flung back into the family unit. Um, and then around about that time, I'd been to a football match with my dad and saw two brothers, um, much like the, the brothers that end up in our film, adult brothers, very sort of burly working class, who were sort of hurtling abuse at each other throughout the whole game in a very fiery, uh, combative kind of way. Um, but the younger brother had, had Down syndrome, and so there was this kind of juxtaposition of 
of that brotherly relationship and then this kind of duty of care. So they were the initial kind of catalyst, they were the seed. We ended up speaking about these characters for the rest of the week. And I think initially the, the, the opening image was uh, these two with this kind of fairly elaborate urn and carrying around their mum's ashes and thinking about how we could sort of take them on a journey that would take two characters that are polar opposite ends of their sort of uh, their grief, their approach to grief and their sort of relationship with uh, each other and, and, and their, their family. And so I can't actually uh, remember exactly when the sort of bucket list kind of idea came about, but whenever it did, it, it really sort of um, galvanized the whole idea and, and, and you sort of gave us a very uh, real and kind of tangible uh, driving force, as you say, to kind of take these characters on, on a journey. And then in terms of our, our casting, yeah, we, we got, you know, incredibly lucky. I think it's a, you know, it's a character study and, and without the right actors in, in those roles, it, it would definitely would not be, be here. So we've got the remarkable James Martin, who plays Lorcan. Is he here today? I think he is. Give us a wave, James. There he is. Congrats. I'll not say too many compliments, so James's head gets bigger and bigger, but now James is, James is a real natural star, um, and remarkably, the Oscars on Sunday is James's birthday. Whoa! So he's coming with us, for sure. We're gonna have some cake on the red carpet. Um, but yeah, so James is a remarkable actor. We, we sort of, we'd written like a first draft of the script, and then we, I, I knew a little bit about James before. James is a bit of a local legend in Belfast, where I'm from, but I'd not seen him act before. And then he'd sort of been in his debut acting role in a TV film, and we both kind of just finished this first draft. We saw James and the penny dropped, so we wrote this letter begging him to do the job, and thankfully he came on and really bought into the script. And then, you know, with a, with a sibling pairing, it's really, it's tricky. You know, you've got, um, you've really got to try and find that chemistry, that sort of, uh, similarity, you know, and, and sort of, uh, we, we had these tapes in from different actors and it was, we couldn't quite find the thing. And then Seamus O'Hara, the remarkable Seamus O'Hara, who plays Turlock in the film, uh, the tape came through and it was one of those moments where as a filmmaker, you just breathe a sigh of relief and he'd given us everything we'd written on the page and more and some ideas and it was just really exciting. So look, these two guys are the heart and soul of our film. We pointed the camera at them and we just stayed out of the way quite a lot because um, we really struck gold by finding them. Well, they do say 90% of the success of any film lies in who you cast. So well done. The only question I have is, what was he a legend for? <laughs> a legend in Belfast, man, many a thing. Um, <laughs> James's dad actually is a retired radio DJ in Belfast and he, on a very much beloved kind of morning show, and he used to bring James on the show, uh, maybe on like a Father's Day kind of special or Christmas Day thing, and everybody was like, bring James on every <laughs> single day. So James quickly got this cult following, including my own mom, who when we'd written the first draft of the script said to me, what about young James Martin? And so maybe maybe it's her we should be crediting. Thanks, mom. She's the casting director of this film. Moms. Uh, by the way, I just want to share that when I was asking them in the green room before, so what are you all doing? Uh, what's a highlight of L LA? And they told me, well, we had scheduled to go um, to Burbank, but we discovered we need COVID tests for the Oscars, so we have to go get those today. Doing our COVID Good tests, luck. yes. Good luck. Uh, all right, and now for uh, our folks with the beautiful film, Eva Lou. Um, the storytelling, as many have described, is beautiful and poetic, and it's against a very, very dark plot. And I wanted to ask you all, there is a lyricism to this, and it may now have to do with what you described as the influence and the source material for the book. But how did you find the balance, um, which is very, very delicate, to both build the relationship between the sisters and also to very obliquely imply what's actually going on in the home front? No, um, it was obviously a balance because, um, and also trying to bring in a little bit of hope in this in this very dark story. The graphic novel that is, is based upon does have an even more uh, dark ending than the film. Uh, in the graphic novel, uh, Eva Lou hangs herself um, at the military base, 
And whereas we kind of played around with the, the myth of the mother of the sea, which is a famous myth in, in Greenland, in order to you know, try and be a bit more open and poetic uh, about the ending. And also we added the character of the grandmother, who I believe is at least pointing in some direction of, of hope, which is that the community around these kids have to do something about it. Because I think the most devastating thing when we got into the research on all of these victims is more than 50% of, and it doesn't go only for Greenland, it's just you know a universal problem, but most of these kids tend to think this is their own fault, mm -hmm. which is terrible because, and that's why they're not putting up a fight really, or, or because they really think maybe they could do something different in order not to be raped or abused, which, which is terrible. So I think the community plays an important part in anywhere in the world where this takes place. And the grandmother was really, you know, that balance of trying to open up for a little bit of hope, saying that if the community or relatives or friends or anyone who sees or sense this, talk about it or do something about it or address it, because the kids are not going to do a lot about this because they're struggling figuring out if they could do something different in order to get the, the love from the parents. Um, so that was, that was the balance. And of course, you don't want to come across uh, in a naive way because you don't want to bring in you know, too much of a beam of a light uh, and say that everything is going to work out for these kids because it's probably not, for a lot of kids, it's not going to work out at all. Um, so it was definitely a balance. Um, um, I'm not quite sure who found it. I feel like we, we did something in order to, to point in some direction, but it was, it was tricky. Well, I just have to say, first of all, uh, for folks who haven't seen it, your use of landscape was exquisite because that sense of vast force is so much larger than you that as a young girl would just feel like they are weighting you down. And where do you go when you feel powerless in the face of that it was really beautiful. And also, just quickly, one of your major characters is a bird. Can you just talk about that? I mean, the raven plays a, a big part in the Greenlandic mythology, and it was also in the graphic novel. Um, and obviously, I mean, people can interpret this in many ways, but I feel like the soul of Evil, who obviously lives in that bird and will live there forever. Um, technically, it was quite a challenge to do a, a, you know, have a bird in there as a character. It is done in many different ways. It's a mix of the birds we actually shot in, in Greenland, just shooting up in the sky and, and getting a lot of, of great footage. But every time it had to fly from A to B, of course, we had to uh, do it in 3D afterwards. And then a third thing was shooting a real physical film raven uh, in the Czech Republic. They have a very uh, well-dressed and trained raven in the Czech Republic. So we shot that up against the green screen. So it's a comp yeah, two birds, yeah, yeah. They get tired really quickly. When one gets tired. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's a mix of a lot of things to make that work. Oh, well done, well done. Um, let me move on. I just only worry about the time. I know we could talk to each of you for an hour. Um, but with Alicia, with Le Papier, um, as you mentioned, it's inspired by a letter that Ferrante had written. And that's a very slight, it sounds like, bit of source material which you had developed into this beautiful piece. And one of the things that I wondered about is please talk a little bit, uh, again, for those of you who haven't seen it, it is an extraordinary cast of girls, young girls. And as you said, 40s, the war is going on. And also, guess who they're taken care of? By nuns. Now, having been raised Catholic, all the way, babe, you know, grade school, high school. May I just say I'm quite familiar with that world. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that sense of uh, you brought poignant humor to your young lead's dilemma. So. Uh, yes, uh, the letter uh, tells just the last part of the movie, the Christmas lunch of a um, group of boys. So first things, 
first thing I decided to change in girls mm -hmm. because I thought girls has, have the power of split the cake. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> this is cooperative. So, so I thought if I have to tell this story today, they should be girls. I think was important. And uh, mm, I love movies. I more love uh, people <laughs> and children. And I know when you make movies with children can be very dangerous for children. So the most important things uh, was to make them feeling they are really all the same. So there is not one protagonist. This is why we didn't cast uh, Serafina, the protagonist. We cast immediately 17 girls all together. And we didn't know for real who is Serafina. Every one of them could be Serafina. Then for uh, two weeks with mm, play games, it was COVID time. So we, um, we were obliged to spend all the time together because we couldn't see other people. <laughs> uh, we test and we, are, we, see, we stay always together. And after two weeks of working with, uh, I always work with a big friend of mine that is Tatiana Lepper is also an acting coach. And after two weeks of working, we, uh, we saw the character coming um, up like flowers, not like <laughs> coming down into the children. So, and uh, we understood that Melissa is Serafina. But in the realized moment, I thought she was the best Serafina. And as the children thought that who talks more is more important, they thought Serafina is not important <laughs> because she just says like, io sono cattiva, no? I'm a bad girl. So she's not talking a lot in the movie. So they thought she's not uh, the protagonist for sure. And <laughs> she does, yes. So, and we, um, I think for with children is always very important to be very careful that you don't, uh, the movie doesn't, uh, so, uh, uh, yes, affect uh, them. They, in a negative way, they, 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 it's a really a game. Game, it's something very serious uh, for children, but it's a game, so it's very important for me. And this is also why when we present for the first time the moving can, we decide to go with all the girls together because I didn't want that one is considered the most important, no? all together. So this is how we cast the girl. We cast with a uh, video on WhatsApp because it was, <laughs> uh, was COVID uh, very strong at that time and we couldn't make a casting. So they just sent, we, we, we asked in Bologna, uh, in uh, yeah, self tapes. So we saw a lot of self tapes. And with the nuns, I was uh, more free to choose uh, who I really love to work with. And so my sister Alba, the bad nun, uh, wonderful uh, in her, um, in her character, and then I uh, found uh, actresses I really love. Uh, of course, uh, Miss Rosa Valeria Bruni Tedeschi, but um, Carmen Pomel, all the, all the others uh, nuns was actress I really admire. And one of them, the most young uh, Greta Zuccheri Montanari, she is an example of child that was used for a movie and uh, she was incredible. She did a movie when she was a child, and then uh, she didn't work anymore. So I said, come, come. <laughs> I, uh, she's incredible. And the chimney uh, sweep are my neighbors. Oh. <laughs> so just <laughs> because we always need to think about our neighbors. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. And Alfonso, what made you reach out to Alicia? Uh, I'm a big fan of Alicia. So uh, 
when there was this idea of doing short films around the uh, end of year celebrations in different cultures, languages, uh, backgrounds, religions, and so on. Pretty much the first, the first name that came to my head was Alich. And we know each other throughout the years. So yeah, I had a conversation and the next morning she called me and said, I have a story. I said, it's okay, let's make it. Some things are destined. <laughs> Congratulations. You have good taste, sir. Very good taste. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about Night Ride. Uh, you know, the film, again, is a beautiful blend of seriousness. There's a lot of tension in the film, but also comedic and warm at heart. And I wonder about how, you know, throughout the shooting and the way that you cast the film as well, I'm in its conception of your lead character. I'm wondering if you had in mind about size, was it the actor that inspired you or was it in the conception in terms of how you cast the film? No, it, uh, originally, well, the, 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 the part is, is uh, for a woman and uh, we, we went to Trondheim because we had to go uh, out of our city to to film and and I wanted uh, most of the actors at least to to come from that region. So we visited Trondheim and we had an audition, and so it was an open aud audition. And and then uh, Sigri came. Is Sigri here today? She didn't arrive yet, I think. And and she she did the best audition, so it was natural to choose her. It turns out that uh, Sigrid is a smaller person. And in terms of what's going on, I think thematically in your film, the sense of who are the people that are overlooked and often perceived as outsiders, mm. sometimes based on physical appearance, sometimes based on identity, you have both in your film, which, is, which was, I think, uh, so exquisitely handled and the connection that people who are on the outside, actually when they find a fellow that they feel understands them at their deepest core is one of the things that I really, really admired about your film. And can I just ask quickly about where did this uh, idea of this come from and is it really that easy to steal a tram? <laughs> I know you must have gotten this a million times, but my partner wanted me to make sure to ask. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So, firstly, um, good point about uh, about uh, feeling like an outsider and uh, and being an outsider, and, and in a way, everybody feels that in some part of life or most of life. And um, and and that was a, um, yeah very nice to to have a, a meeting of 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 those two characters on on the tram and. Um, yeah, in in uh, Norway, it is easy to s steal trams. <laughs> so, um, and that, that was probably the reason why we had to move from Oslo to Trondheim because in uh, in uh, in Oslo, actually, a friend of mine stole a tram. So we we do that a lot. <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but, but, but they're trying to stop that, you see. <laughs> I would hope so, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. So, so we had to go to another um, city and ruin their reputation, <laughs> which we hope. Yeah, I did wonder about the Norway version of the MTA, what they thought about your film. Um, and can you just quickly go also talk about how you both came together to collaborate on this? Well, this is actually uh, our first um, film together, and we have a new film in, in the pipeline. So uh, we're working hard on other projects and looking forward to the, to the next film. Maybe, hopefully, not in a tram, because from a producer's perspective, to shoot inside a tram, it's kind of scary because it's, a lot of, it's moving all the time, a lot of noise. And there are windows, windows all around. So, so, I mean, the whole crew had to lay down 
on the floor inside the tram all, all the time, actually, not to be reflected in the window. So we didn't know what, what was going on. Yeah. While, while the main character was driving uh, the tram at uh, the same time as she was playing her, her part in the film. And there was a tram coming from behind, so we have to keep on going forward. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, logistically, uh, choose another location, but it works well, and here we are. Yeah. <laughs> and you got production insurance. <laughs> Yeah, nice production value, and it's nice to have your producer underneath the seats so you can like <laughs> carry on with your work. There's a lot of bonding. A lot of bonding. Okay, thank you. Um, and now, you know, Cyrus, about the, um, about the Red Suitcase. <sighs> this is a, a film which you've already explained the setup to the audience about a young woman who shows up Hajib, airport, stranger in a strange land, and there's this red suitcase, and it takes us a while to figure out what the heck is going on. And she's acting very odd, and we just cannot figure out why. And so I wonder, you told us about what made you want to make the film, and then that this first idea about a, a young woman in these circumstances came to you. I wondered how you go about your your skill with tension, is is quite quite effective, and so I wonder how you thought about that in preparation as well as when you got in the cutting room. Uh, so the first point is to give empathy to this main actress, main character, and when you give this empathy, then you have the audience already. And then you have to bring problematic for this girl. And slowly, the audience will begin to care a lot about her. Whatever is not going on her direction, because you know her uh, dilemma. And, and the more problematic she gets, the more uh, the audience is caring about her. So that's why at one moment, I wanted the, uh, the, the man understand that she has a red luggage. So by audience understanding this and being very close, so they are very scared. So that was uh, to create this tension till the end. And at the end, when she's uh, going away, normally the audience is saying, oh, you know, and that was uh, the emotion I wanted from, uh, from the audience. This brings us uh, to the editing. The editing was quite tricky because I didn't want to have an action movie. Who says action movie says, uh, fast cutting. I wanted a movie with action, but slow pace. The slower the pace is, the more the audience is going in the brain of this girl. So we knew that the uh, pace has to be slow. But if we do too slow, then it can be boring. So we needed to find this good measure. So instead of having two weeks of editing, I decided to extend it. And we extended to three months. I was always making uh, strangers <laughs> with test screening, uh, I say strangers to the movie, to come and sit here and watch the movie. So they were watching the movie during 20 minutes, and I was watching them. <laughs> because when you show the movie after the, the first thing the, or the people are saying in front of the director, who's also the producer, it's a very nice movie, it's very good. And it's not what I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear the truth. And the truth you see on their gesture. As soon as they were moving or they were asking a question about the movie, I was explaining, but I was writing down the minutage. Where was these things? Because I knew there was a problematic, and so on. So that was the work to find to be not an action movie and that the pace should not be too slow. So that was the work I had to do after the editing. So that was your both questions, so I answer to these questions. I, I have lots to say, but I guess uh, we don't have time. And what else would you like to say? <laughs> I have a lot of things to say, but the usual question is why is the, <laughs> the title The Red Suitcase? So, you know. And why is it The Red Suitcase? <laughs> so um, I wanted that this red suitcase should be her heart. So I decided to, 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 to add everything what is in this small red suitcase, because she's from a very poor family, 
with tender stuff which could come from this family, like these paintings she was doing, all these paintings she was drawing, it's with hair, you know, to do something with the femininity. There was kitsis inside. I put a few tissues working, or I put um, the small books she could have, or this Persian pistache, we're always the mothers give to the children, you know. And then the, the suitcase was full, I closed it, I gave to uh, Nawal Evad, my, my actress, I said, look, treat this uh, luggage like your heart. And then she didn't know, she wanted to put, I said, do you put your heart on the floor? No. So how? I said, keep it like this, mm -hmm. you know, in the exact place where is your heart. And you always keep it like it's your heart. So that's why we try to keep it like this. And then the color was very easy after, it had to be red. So at the end of the movie, when uh, the, the guy is taking this uh, red suitcase, I wanted to give this feeling that it's her heart being ripped off. Thank you. Thank you. For coming up with a great question. <laughs> <laughs> and now let's bring it back. What were you hoping I'd ask? What would you like to say if you had a perfect interview question? Because let's face it, you've all done a lot of press. You get asked the same things over and over. When you walk out, you go, why didn't they ever ask me this? So, Eilert, go for it. Ah, so you, <laughs> did you ask me? You thought I had to continue. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Ah. I can't continue. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to continue on your film, actually. Um, actually, I was joking. <laughs> <laughs> I finished. Um, yeah, well, I've, I've, I've had all, all sorts of questions, um, so, so probably haven't been asked. Uh, there's nothing I haven't been asked. Uh, well, the, the, I'd like to say something, because, because this is a film, you know, about um, um, harassment and, and also about uh, 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 gay rights and transgender rights. Which is is important. Uh, it's important here, but imagine how it is in other countries where where that is forbidden. You know, uh, so 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 that is important. But a lot of my soul in this story is is about you know feeling lonely uh, and you want to connect. Uh, and 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 there's there's a, a melancholy to 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 the story. And there's also this this that life takes you places you don't know where. To where you're going, it, it's uh, um, life takes you in unexpected um, uh, directions where you feel you don't have any control, and that's a lot of my life. I don't have any control of what what's going on. <coughs> so, so that that's uh, probably a question that is a sub <laughs> theme um, that that I haven't been asked. Yeah. Okay, your turn. <laughs> my turn. Yeah. Well. Oh, well, I, I, I think it's, it's interesting to say that, that you know, the, the film, as you mentioned, actually, it, it starts in kind of the comedy, and it gets really dark, and it ends with a hope. And I believe we do need stories today with that brings hope to people uh, in, in in the world today. So, so even if we are trying to address some something that that is difficult, and and and. Um, uh, that we that that is dark, but to bring also some light, see some light at the end of the tunnel is is important, uh, and and that's I guess is what we've been trying to do uh, in the film. We need inspiration, and I think your all these films are bringing it into the world. Um, okay, so Alicia, yes. Ah, yeah. <laughs> I, I have to make the question. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what? Here's two ways you can answer this. Ah. Ah. Or what's one of the favorite bits of direction you gave to an actor? Either one. Ah. Uh, with the children, we promised that the end of the shooting they can eat the cake. So probably <laughs> <laughs> that was. <laughs> I'm sorry, I always talk about this, but we had the three cakes: one with chocolate and cream, one without chocolate for the dog, <laughs> and one without milk for the people that are uh, allergic to me. So it was very complicated <laughs> question. 
in each scene, they say, let's take the cake for the dog. <laughs> take the cake for the so it was very complicated. But everyone had a piece. No, maybe uh, I think what I love, really, really love, it's to make meet people that they don't meet in the, the life. So like to make uh, important actors meet with um, like, for example, the Cemini, il Spazza Camino, Cemini, the chimney cleaner, like the chimney clean sweep, yes, like uh, so non actors with actors, um, uh, people that are use uh, that, that normally they know they control themselves with people that can control children, and uh, you know old and. And I love this. And sometimes, in the moment, I'm te terrified. Mm -hmm. I'm really terrified. For example, uh, also in this short, when you have a dog, have to do this, the children have to do this, and the actor, and, other, and everyone is screaming, and um, <laughs> and say, why I'm doing this? <laughs> no? Like, but then I know it's because I love. To see at the end of the movie, they say, ah, "I'm so <coughs> happy I met this, those people." Like to make it possible, to make this meeting possible, make a movie. It's really to build a square, no? Like <laughs> all the people are in this square, and uh, they are in the same place, and they can meet, and they can, and the meeting can change their life. So uh, a child can change the. Uh, ideas of an actor. An actor can change the ideas. For example, the uh, non-actors uh, normally they feel ridiculous. No, they are like uh, embarrassed. see embarrassed. No, say I don't want to do this. But then when they see the actors, that the actors do everything uh, with so much si serious, yes. serious way, so they accept the game. And um, I think also in this little movie, we did it possible to make mm, people uh, meet each other. Thank you so much. I'm going to just jump to the last two directors because I see our lights. We may be needing to wrap up sort of soon. So if I may, can you talk about either a question you wish people would have asked that you never really get a chance to talk about or a high point in the directing experience? I mean, the high point was was working in Greenland and doing this in a different language than my own. I'm from Denmark, and we have a whole entire Greenlandic crew here and the two or three wonderful actors who were in the film. So, and it took such much courage for them to be part of this film on many different levels. Um, first and foremost, because obviously they want to tell this story themselves, and I totally understand that. Um, so it was a long, long journey to figure out a way to do this together. Um, and then also, of course, understanding that for these two girls, uh, Mila and Nili, who put their faces to the film, this, who's sitting somewhere right here, I is, uh, yeah. I can see them. Welcome, and thank you. It's, it's obviously a very uh, sensitive uh, thing to do because they come from a, a s small society and where everybody knows them. Or, and it's you know it's a it's a delicate subject matter uh, in Greenland, like a lot of other places in the world, but also in Greenland. So to put their faces to a film and trusting us to do a good film, mm. let's say this film hadn't worked out and everybody would have uh, criticized not only them but everybody in Greenland who helped do this film. On on doing it, the, so they they risked a lot more than we risked. Um, mm -hmm. So to have them here and and to enjoy this together with this entire crew is f is for me the the highlight of of the movie and 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 being here t uh, today and obviously also on Sunday. Thank you. I I think it's beautiful to remind people of the responsibility and power you have as directors, all of you, and it seems to me none of you take that lightly. Um, and last but not least. Um, well, we, we do get asked this, but I'll kind of bring it up because it's important to us. But um, for obvious reasons, we get asked questions about um, representation in the film for actors with uh, disabilities and learning difficulties. And um, I think what was really important for us in setting out to make the film was that in 
in Lorcan was a character that um, had agency within his own story. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important that th these characters are not just uh, present, you know, it's not enough for them to just be present in the story. They have to be active as protagonists. And I hope that James's brilliant performance in it kind of sh shows what, what, what can be done when you, when you kind of entrust a character with that responsibility as well. Um, we don't often get asked who wrote all the funny bits, and it was me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <clears throat> Anything you'd like to add? <laughs> Every time. He loves that one. <laughs> to be fair, he did. He wrote that line, you know, the English are no crack at all. He did write that <laughs> one. So he's, he's at least he's self-aware. Um, no, you know, I think um, the only thing I'd add is, you know, th this is a Northern Ireland, you know, people ask about this Irish, amazing Irish year of cinema. And the, I think a quarter of the nominees are Irish in the acting categories. Yeah. And uh, we, we feel very, very proud to be a, a small part of that, but, you know, especially representing Northern Ireland, where, where, where I come from. And, you know, I think um, I think this is the 25th year since peace, you know, since our Good Friday Agreement and peace in that country. And look, this film isn't about that at all, and for, you know, intentionally so. And it's really, it's a matter of pride for me to sort of show the place in a different light. You know, sometimes we've been known for our history, mm -hmm. and it's important for for me and I think a lot of my generation that we we show the kind of the charm of the place and the wit and the heart that uh, far, far exceeds the kind of the, the negative history. So that, yeah, that means a lot. Yeah. Well, I wanna just, I just wanna thank you all again and what a great conversation. Thank you for all that you've shared. And I just wanna call back as I wrap up a bit of what you've said, Rebecca which is I think the beauty and power of film is that it gives you a chance to apprehend versus comprehend. Comprehend comes later, but what film does is it can cut you to the quick. It sort of circuits, uh, bypasses the brain, and it goes to your heart and your gut. And I'm so grateful we have these extraordinary people here who have done that so beautifully. So thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Go see them if you haven't yet. And enjoy the show.